Hello and welcome to The Smartest Moron, where we finally close out Valkyrie Profile with the weakest game in the series. And sadly, the last entry. You know, ignoring the mobile game. On the positive side, I didn't expect to be defending this game. Kinda, sorta. Let me put it this way, compared to the third birthday, it's significantly better. Purely for the fact that I can believe someone who loved the series actually bothered to research and accurately put together a title that feels like it's part of the same universe. After buying the game for about 18 cents, I'm serious by the way, after using eBay bucks, which are basically gone by now, and I just couldn't resist checking it out. Plus, after doing reviews for so long and dialing back the anger, I could technically see some good in games I previously trashed. And as we have seen with games I loved in the past, I don't hold the same opinion I do now. So this seemed like a good opportunity to see if I enjoyed the game compared to the previous review back when I only did articles on my blog. And I do, in certain parts. However, let's take the time to talk about one of my favorite dev teams. Triace. Triace is responsible for a number of games I love beyond just Valkyrie Profile. Resonance of Fate was a fantastic if hard to follow shooting RPG, Infinite Undiscovery was a fun if flawed title, and Star Ocean exists. Look, give me time to at least play the remake of Game 1. Kinda busy at the moment. Hell, they even helped on Lightning Returns, which I always joked was the third Valkyrie Profile game with how you collect souls in that. Regardless of my feelings on certain titles, I always knew I was in for an interesting gameplay experience I couldn't really find elsewhere. Their games sadly never seemed to get any major attention, and even if they worked on a big series like Final Fantasy, I never knew about their involvement until years later. Or if I did, I quickly forgot. But hey, it's not like they would be shifting to mobile game development. Nepro Japan got a hold of the company in 2015 to work on mobile games. Yeah. To be fair, they still work on console games, but, well, I think it's safe to say we will never get a Valkyrie Profile 3, and it pisses me off. Hell, some fans were pissed at getting this game instead of a proper Game 3 since Covenant of the Plume is basically just filler. Interesting stuff, but not the content people wanted to see. And then I was proven wrong as I bring you this post-editing update. On top of Square Enix registering the name Valkyrie Elysium, we also have a new Star Ocean game being made, showing that yes, Triace is still working on console games. So maybe it is possible for Chris to finally get her own game. Or just another game in general. We can only hope it's not just more mobile or free-to-play garbage. So let's just see how things turned out in this review of Valkyrie Profile, Covenant of the Plume. Let the games begin. Our protagonist this time is named Wilfred, a mercenary working alongside his friend Ansel. No more controlling Valkyries this time, barring the Seraphic Gate, we get a more human perspective on what happens to those on the tail end of Lennis' mission. For those who need a reminder for some odd reason, the Valkyrie carry the souls of the departed up into Asgard, where they will fight for the gods as Ein Harriar. Seems like a great honor, if they can get past Odin and the other gods join together to form a turd sandwich. But the focus here is on the people, and they don't take the losses well in most cases. Some like Fiona believe it to be a great honor, while others blame the Valkyrie herself for the loss of their loved ones. And admittedly, I thought this was really dumb as it actively ignores how war works. Then as I played once again this year, I started to realize how limiting that mindset was. Experiencing loss can lead you to blame supernatural forces or anything really, we say God damn it all the time, and with the gods only taking as opposed to helping Midgard, it wouldn't be out of place for them to be blamed for the deaths of good people. Further not helped when Leneth keeps leaving behind feathers after taking a soul. Do you think that's how they make the Union Plumes to revive people? But yeah, this attitude is far more believable to me now, especially as misfortunes just keep on piling up, making people more hateful and wishing they could blame someone. And I imagine it would be hard to hold any contempt for a killer if they don't actually know their identity. Wilfred is one such person, losing both his father and sister, blaming the Valkyrie and believing her to ruin everything. Things aren't made better when his mom starts to lose her mind, eventually believing Wilfred to be her late husband later. Wait, come back. This isn't like Shadowheart's Covenant, I swear. So in order to help the family out, Wilfred and Ansel work as mercenaries. Unfortunately, they are cornered by demons, with Wilfred seemingly struck down, until his friend Ansel helps him out of the jam. Also, a weird thing that only just occurred to me in this game, the dialogue feels a bit off to me. Not sure if it's because the game seems more wordy or having more accents, it definitely feels different and took a while to adjust to. Not bad or anything, I like me some Scottish swordsmen. I've got something for you. Finishing strike! 
Reign of Terror! <laughs> How did that strike ya? In addition to getting scenes of what I just discussed, we also see him being contacted by a mysterious being promising to grant him power to slay the Valkyrie. When he's woken up by Ansel and surrounded by more monsters, he finds a darkened plume. This is the Destiny Plume. With it, the user can grant the targeted ally a tremendous boost of power, easily surpassing almost anyone on the field, as seen when used on Ansel. One must remember, though, power comes with a price, and this causes the death of Wilfred's good friend, forced to watch as he dies, even seeing Ansel despite trying to pass on respectably, still trying to cling to life in his final moments. Such a tragic scene really hits home for Wilfred, given how they intended to work together to make money for their families. And now, not only is his friend gone, it's all his fault. With such guilt, he naturally flees the scene. Now alone in the forest, a woman by the name of Aelith appears, claiming to be an aide to Wilfred now, and a servant of Hell, the Queen of Nippelheim. She's able to rather quickly convince him to keep using the plume, and she'll help encourage the act, like telling Wilfred to visit his mom, only to see her sanity grow worse. All of this, of course, is to keep him on track, to let his vengeance turn him into an edgelord. Anyway, let's cut to the gameplay. As you may have noticed, this is now a tactical RPG. While the combat system works relatively the same as the previous titles, now you need to worry about positioning so your team can properly attack foes. Each character has a range and falls into a certain class. Swordsmen can attack around any square around themselves, as opposed to just four directions. Lancers have a much more extended range, though trying to do air combos is much harder. Mages have an even longer range, though they still can't change the goddamn spell in the middle of a fight for some stupid reason. And the archers have the longest range around but they can't hit foes if those guys get into sword or lance swinging range. Their combo gain is kinda crap, and even their damage output is… meh. Not entirely useless, I got by with a major too. It's just they're not the greatest. We even have unique classes like the Thieve and Pugilist, though their range is pathetic. That being said though, I love using August whenever I could combo with him, and their movement speed can make up for the poor range, especially during boss fights. Remember my complaints about grinding in the last game? Well, they just took out grinding altogether. While the game does have branching pathways and optional areas, things are much more linear. Finish this optional side quest to get gear and want to go back to grind? Too bad! This also means no dungeons, because this game hates you and wants to grind your bones into paste. Enemies in the story battles will quickly kick your ass if you don't plan things out. I may have said archers aren't great, but that's mostly me using them. When enemies decide to play with the annoying bastards, they can help trigger enemies to combo you now too. Another thing to watch out for are the gems. Instead of regaining AP, these red and gold orbs fall out of enemies if you combo them while they are grounded. These grant the unit additional times to attack, and since enemies can get them and hit like a truck to boot, without a good strategy, you're gonna get cheap shotted and die. This is made worse when boss units can spam soul crushes. The funny thing is, they don't even need to hit you or build up their combo gauge or anything. However, this was all done purposely so you could take advantage of one of the tactics the game gives you. And I also have proof of that. For instance, let's listen to the major boss theme. Fear is the true test of courage. So yeah, they knew, they freaking knew what they were doing, the cheeky little shits. I kinda love them for spelling it out this way though. The game wants you to use the Destiny Plume a lot at first. See, when Wilfred sacrificed Ansel, he was able to gain a skill. This one is probably gonna be used a lot early as it doubles your stats for two turns and attracts enemies to you, which is helpful in enduring a soul crush as your other teammates get into position to finally kill them. But wait, those mages are too annoying and damaging. Or maybe you have one of those annoying missions where you have to protect someone, and their AI is rock bottom stupid as they just stand there, and they'll just be dead anyway for the stupid story, wasting your goddamn time! <clears throat> sorry, sorry, trying to calm down the rage. I hated that mission. Anyway, you can sacrifice a certain character to gain the paralysis skills to halt foes for a few turns, helping to buy you some breathing room. Not everyone has a tide changing skill though, but given how tough fights are, I wanted to cover some bases, and you need to choose wisely. AP is still a thing, but it doesn't determine attack stamina. Certain scrolls will allow you to gain certain abilities, technique scrolls which give you passives to equip, and tactic scrolls which grant new abilities. You can increase your movement, draw or deter enemies away from you, and add a bunch of other stuff I admittedly never use too much. 
But in the hands of someone who isn't a meathead, basically not me and my brilliant strategy of punching things till they die before me, they can be helpful. And because Wilfred's unique bloom skills eat up between 50 to 100 AP with no way to restore it beyond just waiting around, you need to choose skills wisely and pick off enemies. That said, the AI tends to not be the smartest around. They got damage numbers and know how to combo, but that's it for range for the most part. Unless you get into range, it feels like they just stand there and look pretty. Of course, some stages group them together on occasion to keep battles from being way too easy. Though these fights can take a while due to one other factor, Sin. Remember how in previous titles, Overkill would appear after hitting a dead foe? I always wanted some kind of reward for it beyond the usual crystals and gems, and even then that was mostly just air juggling. This game finally gave me one in the form of items. Each foe needs to be pounded on repeatedly, and is worth up to 100 sin. 120 if Wilford has a certain accessory equipped. I never had much problem meeting and surpassing the quota. It's just a matter of patience and properly setting up your team for the best combos. My only issue is how the fights drag out, and you're going to want to at least double your sin quota since this will net you better rewards, which include damn good equipment you aren't going to get elsewhere. Sacrificing a character also gives you the needed sin quote anyway, so I doubt you're going to run into many game overs. The next story segment centers on obtaining two new allies, the Archer Charifa and her father Loxwell. Though getting them proves to be rough, for Sharifa is actually an assassin who decided to deserve her position, and is now being hunted down by other assassins, including her own father. I should also mention that the Destiny Plume can't just be used on anybody. You need an actual strong bond, so it's not like Wilfred can just sacrifice Sharifa right away. Anyway, their story is kind of told a bit clumsily towards the end, though it's still enjoyable with how the two view each other, like with how Loxwell got into this position in the first place, and his reluctance to kill his own daughter. With them refusing to kill each other, they decide to join Wilfred with Sharifa deciding to show him how good the world really is. I sacrificed her the most in my playthroughs. I'm sorry, I'm not a fan of archers in this game. See, if you're in game two, that might give me a different opinion. From here, Wilfred's journey is a bit more open, for you can choose a starting point in chapter two. You won't really know what you get until you do it, but starting from the bottom, Wilfred will meet back up with Hugo, and it will be in charge of killing some rebels, along with two children who are very murder happy. The middle option eventually has Wilfred helping out the rebels, while the top is kind of the same, but a bit more spoilery, and let's just put it this way, things don't go well. From there, the next two chapters revolve around a set of characters, but it might be different depending on how you play. This is where sacrifices come in. There are a total of three endings to get, and sacrificing more than two units will lock you into the worst ending branch. Here's an example of how things work. By sacrificing one person, I ran into Lisa Lot, a mage on the run who steals Wilfred's sword. Should I sacrifice two characters, then I would get to recruit Rosia and even meet a cowardly man who met Wilfred's father, and even blames himself for the man's death. Regardless, you are getting more potential sacrifices and plume skills with each chapter. It's totally possible to sacrifice them all just to buff yourself, though Wilfred will be in a bind. This is also cumulative, so if I say sacrifice Sharifa, and then sacrifice another character in the next chapter after getting Lysalon, I will be put into the worst ending track since I killed two people in this run. There are two things to keep in mind, though. Until you reach chapter 5, your sacrifices are limited to one per chapter, and if you break that rule, well, Freya will come down at the end, and... It's freaking Freya! Actually, trying to get to her is already a challenge since her spirit squad kicked the crap out of me before I could reach her. What's funny is that beating her is totally possible. Sadly, it only leads to a game over. Why does she stop at chapter 5? I don't know, I think she had to catch a show or something. Damn it. turned you into a frog. It was a wonderful joke. It was indeed hilarious. There is, of course, another plot to drive Wilfred to seek out different battlefields. The events of the game are all set in Artolia, the same place Jolanda was a princess of, though obviously before her time. The country in Game 1 was on the brink of collapse, so we witness how things are falling apart, with two princes fighting for the throne, while as certain parties do their best to drive them into more acts of aggression, like attempted assassination. There's way more stuff in the notes which I would normally roll my eyes at, but well, the story works without it. The setting is small, so we do get to know all the big players, and we do see different kinds of scenes depending on the ending branch you get. And it kind of works for Wilfred's character. During these moments at a tavern, the only things worth noting are the exclamation marks. Since this game lacks places to grind levels, finding these unlocks a bonus optional area to traverse to gain experience and new items. So in short, this is Wilfred's thought process. The prince has promised to raise the taxes to destroy our lives. I don't care, I want to kill the Valkyrie. Vilnor are the ones who plot to pit us against each other. Why won't anyone listen? For Ulf's sake, I don't care. I just want to kill the Valkyrie. Can you please take care of these troublesome creatures for us? 
The land will be ruined if they are not slain. You saw me reject those clowns, why the bloody hell would I help you? Because, um, they have tools that can be helpful to your journey? I'm intrigued, but... Also, those items might be strong enough to help take down even the Valkyrie? See? See, now this guy gets me. His obsession with the Valkyrie is causing Wilfred to ignore most other options, just looking for more people to manipulate and use for his own benefit, depending on the situation. Or in some cases, he's the one manipulated. He's not exactly a man of justice, and while he's capable of doing the right thing, the more he sacrifices, the more he loses himself and it will be reflected in certain scenes. The lack of some things being connected might push people away from him, which is why whenever I start a no-sacrifice run, I try to help the rebels as they are the only decent people in this war, since otherwise the other two paths really make no sense with who he's trying to become. However, that's the only point I feel the story falters. New Game Plus is essential in seeing how all these stories play out, since you keep all the gear, items, and even plume skills, the journey to those endings is much easier. Granted, the good story route I'll explain why you need to get certain plume skills later. And finally, the Seraphic Gate. Since there are no more dungeons, this is just a place where you can use any party member you wish, even able to replace Wilfred if you want to kick the Edgelord to the curb. The story here is far more comedic and silly, and I kinda like that. It allows for fun interactions with characters who don't really talk to each other that much, and after so much doom and gloom, I could badly use some comedy. If you aren't ever going to beat the game, I recommend looking them up on YouTube. You can even recruit other characters like Lendeth and Chris too, and if you are having too much trouble, you can start from the beginning and grind for levels. Sadly, no plume abilities, so the grinding might be needed. Honestly, I don't know. I didn't get very far and only did this on the side when I couldn't edit anything. Overall, I don't hate Covenant of the Plume, but I'm not exactly rushing the shielder from hate either. There are some interesting ideas in place, and I would have loved to see some of these future characters return as Ein Harry are in future games. Even some of the sacrifices were able to move my stone heart, but the gameplay feels slow, I don't like the bird's eye view, and it took away the dungeons I love from both titles. I don't even mind the move from a handheld console, if anything, I think I would prefer the series remain like this. Still, at least games like Indivisible were able to keep my love for the style of gameplay alive, despite certain dickheads ruining the fun for everyone. I do hate how this has to be the last game, but I'm nowhere near as bitter as I once was when covering this all those years ago. Anyway, on to some spoilers. to explain what I liked about certain chapters. Chapter 3 is where I start to get hooked into it, and it focuses on two mages, Rosia and Lazelot. Both were friends once upon a time, though when their master had been slain, the two grew resentful as the blame fell onto both of them, and they were exiled for it. Lazelot didn't exactly have a good childhood either, so she ended up pursuing a life of crime, while Rosia decided to dedicate her time to helping the less fortunate by traveling the lands, though also has enough hatred in her heart to kill Lazelot if pushed too hard. Lazelot tries to kill Langrate to start a war, while Rosia is trying to deliver a letter in the hopes of ending it. In the bad routes, you can recruit either of them, Though in the good ending, they both die, killing each other. It basically tells a good story with likable and tragic characters. I remember my first time playing and being super pissed off that Rosia died, being burned to death just for trying to pray for her friend's soul. Then again, the gods are assholes, so maybe she had that coming? I don't know. Meanwhile, Rosie is trying so hard not to give in to her hatred, and in ending C, we really see what happens when she fails. The result actually terrifying since she actually attacked Lieselet, believing she was just going to be betrayed again. And in ending B, I do feel bad for Lisa lot since she leaves herself with nothing, and killing Rosia doesn't fix her life. Instead, she looks more empty than ever before. So to have both die in the good ending round, it made me wonder where things were going, as neither seemed intent on killing their master. Then came chapter 4, another good one. If you sacrifice someone anyway, it shows the struggle of House Hon, who mourn the loss of their son. Only one family member thinks they shouldn't grieve. Fiona, thinking it was an honor that the Valkyrie took him away. She definitely goes too far in some of these scenes, though given this is also a house that raises warriors and thrives on battle, kinda the fault of the parents for raising their kid like this. More importantly, it shows the clash of ideas when it comes to the Valkyrie, how other people feel about her actions, even if Lenneth didn't guide a sword into their son's body. This was the kind of stuff I wanted from the game, 
and the death of Nicholas along with certain other political interferences makes everyone except Fiona not wish to engage in war, with August even willing to bend the knee just to make sure he doesn't lose any more of his children. From here, either Fiona dies, leaving Valmar going insane and the parents eventually joining Wilfred to hunt down the Valkyrie, or the parents do die, not wishing their kids to fight for the honor of the house, but to just live. And they do so! By living for pure vengeance and wishing to end the war. I don't think I made that situation any better, so you might be wondering what happens in the good ending route of that chapter. I have to introduce the mage I wanted to like, Foxnell. See, turns out he was trying to help kickstart the war. When Valmer approaches Foxnell and says how their house won't participate, he sends assassins to murder the lot of them, in every single route. It's just in this one we actually see it was him that actually did everything. And since Wilfred got to Valmar as he was prematurely killed, it's safe to assume Wilfred was too late to save the others, especially when he doubled back to deal with Foxnell. Again, assumptions being made since otherwise, Housebawn just died and Wilfred stood back and let it happen, which seems highly unlikely given the story route. However, that's a minor nitpick when compared to the real issue. See, Chapter 3 also had a character named Ushio join you, who was hunting down the person who killed his master, the same one Rosie and Lisa let were blamed for. And Rosie's dying words helped him realize that by dedicating his entire life to it, what would he have left? Both people he assumed are gone and regardless of who did the deed, nothing makes him feel better. And immediately in the next chapter, Wilfred meets the man who actually did it, who proudly admits to doing it, and Ushio doesn't even exist. Okay, mechanically speaking, characters from previous chapters can't interact with one another, so I could have easily sacrificed Ushio in this chapter, so it kind of makes sense why he wouldn't do anything. But it feels criminal to not have these two interacting, even if Ushio didn't want to avenge his master. Two former friends were pitted against each other, and he just had to see them brutally die a few stages ago. And that's the problem of this game, and to be fair, the problem of many choose-your-own-adventure games. Chances are, I'll be ranting about this again in other titles, but the lack of character interactions really harms the story when written like this. I get wanting to have Fox now. Both the previous games allowed you to recruit characters who were either villainous or bordering on the edge to show how some Iron Hair Yar were unavoidable in obtaining due to the job of being a Valkyrie. So to have a character who utterly kills some of the best people in the game, it sounds like a fun idea, begrudgingly working with the guy and not sacrificing his ass immediately to get our revenge. Seriously, piss off, you killed two of my favorite mages. But the execution just feels weak. But let's be real, this is the only reason Foxnell isn't leaving this game in a body bag. After what you did to everyone, why the hell should I let you live? Because I'm the best mage in this game, and can help you kill the Valkyrie. I both love and hate you. Upon further reflection, I started to understand the point of some of these characters, and kind of one of the themes of the game. We aren't static and can be influenced by those we follow or used to follow given certain controversies. A single decision could change a person's life, and Wilfred is the focal point for that change, given how he can turn out. So by seeing characters who want a revenge, i.e. Foxnell and Ushio, he starts to change his viewpoint. Unless the player wants to screw with that. Had Wilfred not been there to help Rosea, for example, Ushio might have killed her instead. And at the end of it all, much like Lot. He's left empty from it all and can't bear to be alone given the horrible scene he just witnessed. Meanwhile, Foxnell is the more evil of the bunch given how he helped kickstart the war for his own revenge, not caring who got in his way and using them as a sacrifice. Honestly, he seems like a smarter, more political version of Wilfred. Both wanted vengeance given how disastrous their families turned out, and Wilfred has to stop himself since while killing this asshole is tempting, he wants to try and end the actual conflict and he doesn't strike me as someone with a lot of political connections. But like I said before, lacking dialogue with Ushio feels off to me, and the problem still persists even knowing this. I get it, trying to follow a theme, yet other games have done this without sacrificing characters like this. While I'm more of a person who prefers characters over themes, it's possible to balance both for an enjoyable experience. It's like the final section of Digital Devil Saga 2. Most of the emotional investment I had kinda died for a while until I got to the ending. I'll also give the game this, Neither Wilfred nor Royenberg really place their trust in this guy or our buddy-buddy with the douchebag. Still wish he got punched in the face, though. So that just leaves the endings. The worst ending is what you expect. Wilfred can't actually kill Leneth, and it's revealed Leneth was holding back, hoping her death could help satisfy his lust for revenge. This is also the ending where you face off against all the characters you sacrificed, and as expected, Wilfred gets sent to Nipelheim, damned for all eternity. 
There is actually artwork from the mobile game to depict the swarm too. This ending also results in Leneth getting her memory sealed away, Odin believing that since Silmaria's rebellious nature cost him before, it could potentially happen with Leneth, or just create other issues. Best to just hit the reset button. The bad ending though, only requiring a single sacrifice, I'm sorry Ernest, I really need Foxnell, involves Wilfred fighting Leneth, but then all of a sudden, he fights his own father. I really wish all the other Inheriar I got in past games got this kind of armor. It looks freaking awesome. Granted, I will always sell for more dragon lesbians. Anyway, he tries to convince his son to give up this struggle, even revealing how he begged Leneth to bring his son back. I'm guessing he used one of the special Valkyrie wishes or something, but the two just end up coming to blows, with Wilfred confused and believing there is no other path, not with how much he sacrificed to get here. In the end, just as his soul is about to be claimed by Aelith, the Odor pushes his son out of the way, sacrificing himself so his son can try to find some happiness in the world. Which is empty since now Artolia will crumble, things will gradually get worse, and the rest of the ending is basically nothing but this text summary. Honestly, it's hard for me to say if this ending is better or not. A nice twist of things, but the dad doesn't add a whole lot, and his words about learning to find happiness in this world rings a bit hollow in a world filled with monsters and backstabbers. Then again, maybe that's the point, since certain characters got their revenge in this route, yet in the end, they are left with nothing but hatred and misery. I suppose the thing that rubs me the wrong way is how Theodor seemed to just ignore his son's plight regarding his mom's going insane. I doubt psychiatrists exist in this timeline, and even if they did, his family's in poor shape. I imagine he could have at least convinced Lena to hunt down some treasure, drop it at their footstep, and leave them in some stable care. I got a ton of treasure in game one, it's not like she would have to give up any treasures belonging to Odin or anything. Monsters literally drop them. In fact, during these ending routes, Odin explains how they needed to wipe Lenneth's memory, implying this is what caused the seal to be needed, even mentioning how Samaria caused issues like this. So a more compassionate Lenneth makes it really hard for me to believe she and Theodor wouldn't help Wilfred at all at first. Like when Theodor, I don't know, died. Hell, in the beginning of the game, Theodor probably could have just held down his own son with one hand while they talked things out. Meanwhile, ending A, Roinberg is the guy you help, and he kinda serves as a parallel to Wilfred. After his friend the king died, he ended up retiring, tiring of all the political infighting. Unfortunately, since he couldn't try to raise the two princes, they ended up on opposite sides and threatened to destroy the kingdom. Basically, his selfishness ended up helping to ruin things, but much like Wilfred, he's trying to do the right thing, defeat the princes and spare them. This doesn't go well, stabbed by Langry, his stabber commits suicide, and Kristoff has to be told a lie so he doesn't do the same thing. It does at least build Wilfred's own development nicely, how even after all the regrets, all the pain and heartache one goes through, they can ultimately still try to reform, especially when the alternative kind of sucks. Does a slightly better job than a certain nine Harry are. The final battle here is against Aelith, who reveals she is the one who truly helped to kickstart horrible events in Artolia. I'd say that goes against the human conflict, but to be fair, some humans had no issue with summoning demons to their side, hungering for the power of the gods, etc. This stuff was gonna happen sooner or later. Honestly, I could see her pushing Langry or Foxnell around. In terms of gameplay, this can either be the hardest fight due to how these flames just use three magic spells in a row and are capable of great magic too, or this can be the easiest since you are able to gain plume skills capable of nullifying magic for the flames and physical attacks for the final boss, which is very good since their standard attack can hit all your allies. Ansel even helps out in the second phase, and is surprisingly forgiving of Wilfred, admittedly wanting Will to admit his guild, and that's good enough. I mean, it kinda makes sense in their situation, they were both likely died if Wilfred did nothing. Also gotta love how Theodor had to get Ansel to deliver a message to the son, rather than, I don't know, doing it himself. You are a bad dad and a terrible partner. I know this review has kinda been ragging on his father, but the one thing I do like is how, by fixing the music box, Wilfred is able to restore his mom's sanity. Now, on the outside, this seems like a cheap move to fix her trauma, and I can't really argue with that, especially given the large amount of strife they all endured, but it kinda works since it was a task Wilfred found unimportant and often forgot about, not even doing it for the sake of his mother earlier, his mind so focused on killing the Valkyrie and nothing else. By finally deviating from a path of violence and helping to finally try and fix something in the house himself, things are slowly getting back to normal. If there's one thing missing, I feel this would have been a good time to bring in the other characters. Since they can't be sacrificed for this route, seeing at least Sharifa and Loxwell would have been nice. Overall, Covenant in the Plume is... okay. Just okay, and that's really the biggest sin about the story. Because for as much as I love these characters, their stories end on the same chapter they are introduced in. Plus, my interest in the game comes and goes. Why do you think this review took so long? The message kinda works for this game, but I 
don't really care about Wilfred that much. Now, I do think this game was released with a purpose. Maybe to help fuel the idea for a Valkyrie Profile 3, since thanks to the mobile event released years later, we know Chris's backstory does involve Hell. So maybe her and Wilfred would end up working together. Or thanks to the multiple endings, maybe Wilfred could be a nice Easter egg as we find him as a corrupted tool. I can even see characters from this game being used by Chris as Ein Harriar, which could work in giving them more development. It's certainly what I would have hoped for out of a proper third title, and it's hard for me to hate Covenant of the Plume anymore as I grew older. I can't really recommend it though, it's just not my thing. Except for the Seraphic Gate, I can still mess around in that and pretend I'm playing Valkyrie Profile 3. God, my life feels so sad. Special thanks to Patreon supporters for helping to sponsor this hectic episode. And I'm sorry it took so long. Then again, I should really think harder about what I choose to play. Next time, I don't know what awaits us on the horizon. However, I do see the sun rising, and it's looking quite... golden. I'm the smartest moron, and thank you for your time. Wait, what? No, 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 not Jojo Golden Win. Golden Sun is what I was hinting at. Besides, that anime doesn't even have a game. Uh, uh, well, it's not in English. What the f-